Sadlier's webinar series. Um, before we get started, I know there are a few people that are calling in and uh, logging on. I can see that they're, they're still trying to get in. Um, I want to go through a couple of items, uh, just housekeeping items. All the phones are placed on mute so that it provides the best audio for all attendees. There will be a question and answering period at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, during the presentation, please go to your question box, which is in the control panel on the right-hand side. So that little orange box, I don't know if you're on a PC or a Mac, but it's like a little orange box with a white arrow. Just expand it, go down to questions, expand that, and type your question in. It's really easy, and I'll be able to read them at the end of the webinar. Lastly, the webinar will be recorded as long as all the technology uh, um, goes with us, <laughs> so, uh, so that you can review it at a future date or send the link to a colleague who may not be able to attend. So let's begin, and you can, um, Katie, you can start the recording button. Okay. My name is Laura Egan. Okay. My name is Laura Egan. I'm the Director of Man Product Management for Literacy at William H. Sadler Publishing Company. Our presenter today is Dr. Catherine McKnight. I know some of you have um, seen her present at many conferences across the country and maybe even heard her uh, present on a webinar here uh, some afternoon from Savier. Dr. McKnight has been an educator and literacy advocate for over 30 years. She is a published author and consultant for school districts throughout this country, and she travels abroad, um, abroad to different uh, countries as well as across the United States, and she speaks at national and regional conferences. It's been very exciting working with Katie um, to see firsthand how she changes the lives of teachers and students. Thank you, Katie, so much for being here with us today. We are very excited to hear about your learning and literacy centers for big kids. Okay, thank you, Laura, so much. Um, I want to make sure that, um, there we go, I'm going to show my screen, and here we go. And and I am recording too, so we're all set. All right. Hey, everybody, thanks for coming. I, know, I realize that it's um, spring break and testing season and how many days until the last day of school? So we're just like the kids where we count the last days of school. And I am no different, believe me. Um, but as teachers, we're busy uh, 12 months a year, not nine months a year, as, as some people outside our profession uh, falsely believe. So I'm very excited about this topic and the work that centers around um, learning centers, learning and literacy centers. And I'm seeing a lot of growth and positive uh, indications about the model. And many of you, I'm sure, like me, have been educators for quite some time. I've been in the profession for over 30 years. And there was a post on We Are Teachers about um, my upcoming conference in, in Wisconsin in June. Um, if you're able to join us for uh, uh, two days learning about learning centers, learning and literacy centers. And somebody said, hey, you know, what's old is new again. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I get that too. Some ideas that are old, like Marie Montessori's ideas of centers almost 100 years ago, um, actually make a lot of sense, especially with what we know about neuroscience and how kids work. And we used to talk about them all the time with the little people. Uh, with the little guys, but not really with older people, you know, with older kids, um, fourth grade through 12th grade, and even at the college level. I've even used um, centers in university courses because quite simply, they work. It's about chunking our instruction. So uh, without further ado, here we go. So why does centers really work for big kids? Um, they develop content knowledge. It's a great way for us to meet that intersection of literacy skills and content knowledge. And that's something in particular for the older grades that having models for that, uh, um, content area teachers, for instance, a high school or middle school biology or chemistry teacher is told all the time that they have to develop literacy skills and maybe given a couple of strategies for that. 
but really what does that look like instructionally on a day-to-day -day basis? And what I'm discovering is how well centers actually work. And they are different from primary grades because the nature of our students, our audience is different as well. And it gives us that opportunity to really develop those literacy skills. And uh, um, we've heard the expression um, many times that all teachers are teachers of reading and writing. And I get a little sensitive to that, having been a high school English and social studies teacher many, you know, quite a few years ago. And um, also having a, a degree, um, of my PhD in reading and language and my research in that, is that that's kind of an unfair thing. Um, we need folks to be content experts, but we also need to understand how we can develop reading and writing skills, skills and comprehension, and being able to express what we know and understand about a content area. Um, so we need teachers to be experts in their field, but also to understand how we can get kids to understand um, uh, uh, the content that we're teaching and demonstrate what they know and understand and lead to more understanding and, and being able to express what they know. This model is built on gradual release of responsibility. Gradual release of responsibility, of course, is gaining much more popularity right now. Um, thank, thanks in large part to the work of uh, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry. But the idea of gradual release of responsibility and that student-centered um, learning is actually not that new. It really has its roots to um, early childhood educator Marie Montessori and also to John Dewey, of course. So it's not really that new of an idea, but the way that we're looking at it now in our technology age and 21st century classrooms has some differences, but its foundational theoretical roots are actually not that dissimilar. And then the idea of balanced literacy. We know how critical balanced literacy is, that we have to have the synergy between reading and writing, speaking and listening, language, which includes our grammar and vocabulary, and that all of that has to work in a synergetic kind of model. And, and that has been, that concept has been around for quite some time, right? Um, probably for about 30 years. So now it's just, you know, this, this, this foundational knowledge that we have. And the new standards, whether you use Common Core or you're from states like Texas or Virginia that have their own standards, they're all very um, much based on this balanced literacy model. And why? Because the research just keeps showing us um, uh, more and more clearly that that is uh, the foundation on which we need to build instruction. And then formative assessment. I'm seeing a lot of work now being done about skills-based assessment or quote-unquote standards-based assessment. But the ideas of formative assessment are rooted in the work of Jim Popham and Margaret Heritage, where we give kids that on-the-spot feedback, uh, uh, descriptive feedback, and really make sure that kids understand what they need to do to develop skills. Uh, giving a letter grade or a number is not descriptive feedback, but formative assessment is a tool that we can use as teachers to ensure that our kids are developing the skills that we want them to develop and, and also the knowledge, the content knowledge. So, and then of course, differentiated instruction uh, and, and the idea that we meet the needs of all students of course, that's rooted in John Dewey, right, who also believed in that and about democratic classrooms. And then also multi-tiered interventions, formerly known as response to intervention, but now we're starting to use the term multi-tiered inventions uh, and interventions, excuse me. And so these five elements, okay, just very briefly, this is one of the reasons why I get particularly geeked up, nerded up about centers for big kids is that I'm going to show you, um, hopefully the technology will, will, the technology gods will work in our favor. I'm going to show you a video in a classroom that I've been working in for the last two years in East St. Louis, Illinois. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but you'll see elements of all five of these within the classroom. And as I joke with teachers all the time, you can still accomplish these things. And as I tell colleagues, and still have your Saturday night to yourself. Um, that's uh, something that I advocate quite strongly about is that teachers should have their Saturday nights. And while we're at it, let's include Sunday too. All right, so gradual release responsibility. Let's talk about that first. And um, we see on the left there, we have the teacher responsibility. And then on the right, 
the student responsibility. And we always start with a focus lesson. So I demonstrate, it's the I do it. I model for kids how I read a science text, how I as a mathematician look at a word problem, how I as a social studies teacher, history teacher, can source a document and, and maybe write a DBQ, a document-based question and respond to that. So I show kids how I do that first. Modeling, it's the I do it part. And then we have the guided instruction, whereas we do things together. And um, I, oftentimes I'll hear from colleagues, it's like, well, what if they copy? Yes, that's fine if they copy because that we're trying to teach them a skill and show them what the norms are and the expectations are for those particular skills. And then you do together. That's where kids start collaborating. They have a foundational knowledge and development of a skill or the content, and then they can start working on it in more with greater independence in smaller groups. And then the independence, that's why we say I kind of liken it to um, the whole idea of riding a bike and you start off with training wheels and then you have like the wobbly wheels and then you have just one wheel and then you go away. It's kind of the same thing. You know, we start with the sturdiest um, uh, training wheels that completely balance the bike. Then we do kind of the wonky ones that go back and forth. And then we take one off and then we just let the kids fly. So um, that's really critical. And one of the things that we're finding more and more and more, and some of it is rooted in the work of um, Dick Allington, is that kids have to practice. And I know that all of us are under an extraordinary amount of external pressure to cover this and cover that and, and make sure we have this and prepare for the test. But what we're finding more and more is that if kids don't practice the skills, um, they never really develop them. And, and we know the idea about apprenticeship and developing skills so we can work towards independence. And we're finding this out even more and more. I was just at a conference last week in uh, Florida. I was presenting with my colleague, Richard Cash, the Learning and the Brain Conferences. And if you're not familiar with them, I highly recommend them. Um, but they really bring the neuroscientists and the educators together. And we're just finding out more and more with the technology that we have and the field of neuroscience, how critical this actually is of, of the I do it, we do it, um, you do it together, the collaboration and the independence. Okay, so, so the I do part, this is the model that I always recommend, is that we start with a teacher-led mini lesson or whole group teacher guided instruction. So for instance, if um, I'm doing a, a history, you know, if I'm in a history class and we're doing a document-based question or I'm sourcing a document, I show kids how I do that first. I demonstrate for that and I take them through step by step by step and I'm quite explicit about it. And, and um, that's something that I think all of us, um, myself included, need to really focus on is, is making sure that we're being very clear with kids and that we're not assuming that they know how to do something. We do a lot of assuming, especially as the kids get older. And then we want the kids to work in small groups or pairs uh, on that particular skill that we just introduced in that mini lesson. And then finally, the centers give us the opportunity for the kids to start going off of, uh, off of those training wheels where they can really just start working on their own and uh, practice those skills more and more and more. And we also know, too, that kids need to talk to each other. They need to work together, that that is a huge factor in, in actually closing um, achievement gaps and also student achievement is that when kids are given the opportunity to talk to each other while they're developing their literacy skills and content knowledge. Um, and there's also been some studies too. I think it was about a year or two years ago. It was actually something that I saw in Ed Week. And it was a study on um, classroom talk. And, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this too. But what we're finding more and more too is that whoever is doing the most talking is the one who's doing the most learning. So uh, as I coach teachers and work with um, students at the university, I always remind them about democratizing airtime and making sure that as many voices as possible are getting the opportunity to speak. And that's where centers are also um, a really great vehicle to make that happen. So we're really looking at this model 
of, you know, changing these roles from teacher to facilitator. And, and the video that you're going to see um, towards the end of this uh, broadcast is of a teacher that I've worked with, and she talks about it quite quite a bit. And while I've been working on this project with Sadly or on centers and, and such, and I'm interviewing the teachers that I'm working with, um, that word comes up over and over again. When colleagues start making the shift, they say, I am more the facilitator now. And uh, and they're, everybody's really surprised too at how much their kids are capable of doing. Uh, so yeah, so it's very exciting work. You can tell I'm, I'm a little bit passionate about it. I get a little geeked up about it. Okay, let me see what's going on here. All right, there we go. So this is just a, um, a, a great visual on balanced literacy. And so we have balanced literacy in the center. These are the different literacies, um, Common Core and College and Career Readiness Standards, generally recognize um, reading, writing, uh, language, and some, and also speaking and listening, they embed in there as well. But I like to bring up viewing and presenting uh, because in, uh, National Council of Teachers of English identifies those explicitly. I think those are important to include and oftentimes overlooked. So I like to put in the viewing and the presenting as well. And that's even more so with our digital age. And then on the outside ring are all these different strategies, um, instructional strategies, pedagogies um, that have been around, uh, some of them longer than others, and that we're seeing in classrooms. And so things like a write aloud, a read aloud, or shared reading, guided reading, um, which is Fountas and Pennell, um, interactive reading or annotated reading, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry have done quite a bit on that, uh, guided writing, independent writing, work by like Laura Robb, um, uh, uh, Nancy Atwell, Linda Reef, and so on. So there's quite a few manifestations of what we talk about with the balanced literacy. So centers are really about that practice, mastery, and developing independence. So to start with, um, these are recommendations. And one of the things that I think that works with this model is I don't say, oh, you absolutely have to have all these centers all the time. There are times where you may need to double up on something or you need to increase on something, and that's absolutely fine. So for example, we have the vocabulary activity, then we have reading together, writer's craft, and then a teacher-led center. So whether I'm an ELA teacher, a social studies teacher, a math teacher, a science teacher, it's my recommendation that we always have these four centers as kind of our foundational ones. So in the vocabulary activity, there's so much academic vocabulary that we have to cover when we get further and further and deeper into our content areas that we can do all kinds of things there. Um, Kids can do vocabulary slides. Slides. They can do concept sorts. Um, uh, they can do things like pictionary. All kinds of things um, uh, uh, in the vocabulary. And then reading together is when kids are reading a text together, and it's usually a just right text. Usually something that kids pick. So, for instance, if I'm a science teacher and I'm teaching the kids about fungus, and I want them to read about fungus in the world of some kind or some examples. I might have one, um, uh, uh, one text that's on portobello mushrooms, which are pretty tasty. And actually, I just saw this great recipe on Food Network of you making caprice portobello mushrooms. So I'm like ready to try that. So you have one on, on, on mushrooms, right? Then you have another one on penicillin, a great fungus that has saved so many lives, and then something like zombie fungus. And then, of course, if you have middle school students, you might want to include toe fungus or something like that. So everybody's learning about fungus, but we have different texts that kids are reading about different kinds of fungus and how fungus functions. Wow, that's a tongue twister. How fungus functions in an ecosystem. And then writer's craft is not always about writing a full essay. It could be about um, uh, if I'm a science teacher of making sure that kids understand how to write the lab report. If I'm a math teacher, I might uh, uh, want kids to work on extended responses there or explain how computations are related to a real world context. If I'm an English teacher, I might have the kids do a literary analysis or be the character for the novel, all kinds of things. Now, the teacher-led center 
is really quite magical. Once you get the kids, you know, rolling in, in these centers and they're moving along quite well, that teacher-led center is an optimal, optimal opportunity for us to work with kids. Now, we can group kids based on need um, uh, or a particular skill that they need to work on. Or, um, I, or, or maybe, for instance, I want to give kids feedback and I group the kids based on the kind of feedback that I want to give them. But that's our opportunity to touch base with kids and work with them. And in most of the schools that I work in, there's usually a huge range of ability levels. And I'm sure that everybody out there in cyberspace who's listening right now, too, has the same situation in their classrooms that the kids are not all reading on the same level. They're not all performing on the same level. So that teacher-led center is an opportunity for us to work with kids in small groups. Um, okay, and then um, here's some fifth grade center exam exemplars. So for instance, I'll, I'll have my vocabulary activity. The kids are gonna read together. I have writer's craft and then skill practice. So let's say that I introduce the skill of like annotation. I want the kids to practice some more on that. Or let's say that in science, if it's a fifth grade science class, we did something on scientific method. So then I want the kids to work more on that. Or even if they worked on a microscope and, and we're preparing slides or learning how to use the microscope. And then listening or viewing center, um, I'm gonna sound like I'm a thousand years old, but wow, we have so much available to us now that we can show kids. It's not like those old, um, now I'm going to really date myself, those old Bell and Howell movie projectors. I don't know if anybody else out there remembers those and electric typewriters and ditto machines. But, you know, we don't have to do that anymore. So all of these things are available um, uh, as well. And then we have the teacher-led center, which is the opportunity for us to work with kids. Now, I always say this too. And I really mean this, is that we know that um, giving kids a lot of homework doesn't, doesn't work. Actually, there's some um, studies on that that show that there's actually a negative correlation between amount of homework and student achievement. And uh, what actually works is when we encourage kids to read and when they read more and more outside of school. So uh, what that teacher-led center, um, that's a chance that I can look at kids' work give them immediate feedback on how they're performing. And if I'm doing that, my argument is all the time, is that if I'm doing that in the teacher-led center, I, I shouldn't have to take papers home to grade anymore. So you wouldn't, you'd be definitely able to get your Saturday night back and Sunday night um, as well. So, uh, and you're probably like me too, where, you know, I used to bring home papers and papers and papers home and, and not even touch them. So, that teacher-led center is, is, an, is a ripe opportunity to embed multi-tiered interventions for our tier one, tier two, tier three kids, and then also um, to provide that, that very valuable descriptive feedback, formative assessment. Uh, one of the school districts that I'm working in in Farmington, New Mexico, um, has simple goals and complex goals, and the teachers use those on a regular basis at that teacher-led center, and they assess very specific simple goals or complex goals with the kids. So they really can see how they're performing, how they're working on their skill development. And the other thing too, Alfie Cohn has done quite a bit too on um, the effects of grading. Some of you I'm sure are very familiar with his work. But one of the things that we know too is that children of poverty in particular, um, when we go to something like simple goals, complex goals, or skills-based assessment and evaluation, that kids actually, um, especially children in poverty, uh, um, really start growing, that it helps to close the achievement gap. So that's another shout out for that as well. Okay, so um, when we look at these centers, one of the things that can get a little overwhelming uh, is that uh, colleagues will look at me and say, oh my gosh, Katie, there's so much prep that's involved. And you know what? You're right. There is a lot of prep. And one of the reasons why um, Actually, the big reason why I'm working with Sadlier is I actually, uh, my first experience with Sadlier was 30 years ago as a Chicago public school teacher, and my students were using Vocabulary Workshop. I actually still have my copy of my teacher's edition of that. And um, I, I've always been a fan of their materials, but even more so recently, 
where uh, their materials are so conducive to creating many lessons and center activities. So with this fifth grade exemplar, um, what we did with the vocabulary workshop is, or the vocabulary activity, is that we pulled a segment out of one of the units from vocabulary workshop, and then also something from uh, progress, and then read together. This unit actually embedded the American Revolution, because the teacher, Amy Ruth, she's a teacher in uh, uh, Orchid, California, who's just fabulous, and I'm going to get to see her next week. Uh, then we did uh, read together. So we had progress and those other texts that you see are just right texts. What we know after kids secure fluency, which we hope is by the end of second grade, it really is about pages read. The more they read, the better they get. The more they read, the better they get. I'll say it again. The more they read, the better they get. And when kids have choice about what they read, they just tend to read more. And, and there's a substantial amount of research and evidence that shows this over and over again. And I can speak anecdotally to that. Um, uh, I used to think when I was um, a teacher, a high school teacher, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, um, I was a little sensitive to that. I was like, oh, what do you mean giving them choice? You know, they have to read blank, blank and blank in order to be ready, you know, for college or career. And um, uh, I have to kind of, you know, fall on the sword on this one, because what we know is that when we give kids choice, they get more motivated to read. Now, it doesn't mean that anything goes. Each one of these texts that we have here um, are related to the American Revolution or narrative kinds of texts. So they're also going to teach literary elements. And then we also have grade level text, um, very rigorous text, too, that's also in progress. And then writer's craft, for Amy's unit, we used um, Grammar Workshop, and we pulled a lesson from there. One of the things, um, uh, it's based on the um, Beverly Chin was uh, um, uh, instrumental in the development of that program. And I get very excited about uh, Grammar Workshop in a very nerdy literacy educator kind of way, because um, Beverly Chin is one of our most important thinkers in grammar instruction. Um, the only other person I think who can rival her is, is Connie Weaver. Uh, and, and really, you know, in the eighties, I was in that wave where we were told over and over and over again, that you have to teach grammar and context, but nobody was really giving us good materials, um, and an avenue to do that. And that grammar workshop, um, uh, if you look at some of the sample lessons, uh, and the blog that's on Sadlier, you're going to see, um, that they're well-developed and, and they really meet that expectation. Um, and then again, skills practice, we can use some of those other materials. Um, listening or viewing center, we pulled um, some videos from YouTube, from like the History Channel and things like that to teach about the revolution. And then um, the teacher led center is where, you know, like let's say that the kids are having problems with inferences or uh, they don't understand a particular um, uh, uh, aspect of the American Revolution, I can pull them to the teacher-led center and work with them. A lot of the teachers that I work with um, in classrooms have used that teacher-led center is that they look at their centers, and if there's one that they think that the kids are really going to be challenged with, their um, students who they think are going to struggle, they pull them to them first, give them another example or another exemplar from the mini lesson, and, um, I, I, and then they let them through the other centers. So, so they make sure that the kids have got it at that teacher-led center before they send them out to work independently. And that has worked quite effectively in a lot of the classrooms that I work in. Um, just very quickly about formative assessment, just a reminder that it's not a particular kind of measurement instrument or tool. It's really a corpus of tools, um, whether you use a simple goals, complex goals. Um, uh, um, uh, sometimes we could use a quiz, even a test or a extended response. There, there are all these things. But, but what it is, is that we use that information then to drive instruction, that we're really responding to it, and uh, that our feedback is is always descriptive and gets the kids, you know, um, make sure that the kids understand that you're at this level and this is how you need to get to the next level, or you've got this mastered so far in the skill or the content, and this is what you need to go further. And that's very challenging for middle school and high school teachers who see maybe 75 to 150 kids a day. And that's where I think that teacher-led center can really help and facilitate that. And the other thing that I always advise middle school and high school teachers about is that 
that individual feedback. Um, it's very, very challenging to do when you teach sixth through 12th grade. Think of it as a week long process. Did you give individual feedback to a student at least, you know, each of your kids um, one time during that week? Um, uh, and I think that's much more manageable than thinking you have to get to every student every day. I mean, just thinking about that, I get overwhelmed. Um, I taught in the inner city in the Chicago public schools. And I, um, I um, had over 150 kids, so I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'll be honest, I couldn't do it. Um, so qualities of effective formative assessment, again, as I mentioned, that teachers are always making those adjustments in response to assessment evidence and that students get feedback about their learning and advice on what they can improve and that kids participate in that process. So when we have that teacher-led center, Kids can ask questions. They can um, respond to what the teacher's saying. They can have input as well. And let me just say something, too, about Common Core and the new college and career readiness standards, too, is that formative assessment is really receiving um, uh, much more attention with the implementation of, of the new standards because we're really looking at that skills model uh, um, for the standards and, and really looking at balanced assessment that we need to give kids individual feedback. Um, that picture there is just from about a month ago. Yours truly, um, I'm in a teacher led center with some kids and we're working on a specific skill. This is a middle school classroom in, in Indiana, um, where I was last month. And then, um, students need to monitor their own learning, which makes that feedback critical and giving kids more and more responsibility for their own learning. And um, these little girls, they're, they're doing a reading together center. You can see they're working on sticky notes. They're all in um, Farmington, New Mexico, which is in the northwest corner of New Mexico. And that's the district I was telling you about that uses the simple goals and complex goals. And um, for a teacher, it's not just about that feedback. It's really making sure that kids understand um, uh, what they need to do in order to continue to develop those skills. And then just very quickly about differentiated instruction, how this is embedded in the center's model too, is that we can differentiate based on the content. So for instance, when I gave the different texts for fungus, um, uh, that's an example of content process. So there's multiple ways of doing something or there's multiple avenues that you could express what you know and understand and product. And then for the student, we also look at readiness, interest and learning files, uh, learning profiles. So one of the questions I get asked a lot about with that teacher led center or just centers in general is how do I group the kids? And, and it really depends on readiness, like where the kids are, what their interests are. So those just right books can really help you to um, uh, determine your groups. And then learning profile, you know, who are my talkers? Who are my extroverts? Who are my introverts? Things like that. So it really depends on what you're working on um, uh, and, and how we're going to do that and how we're going to group the kids. So the differentiated instruction by by its very nature, centers um, has quite a bit of, of of elements of differentiation in it. Okay, um, and then just whoops, sorry, oh oh, sorry, sorry, went nuts there on the um, uh, on the slides, wrong button, obviously. Um, I want to show you this video first, and then I'm going to talk about the. Um, sorry, it's like Blair Witch Project where I just kind of zip through this. Um, all right. Uh, well, I'm going to go to this in a second, the tips for centers. Um, and, and there's several case studies. I've mentioned some of them. Orchid. I've been working in Rutherford County, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. Anderson, Indiana, and Farmington, New Mexico. And then I'm also going to mention East St. Louis as well, East St. Louis, Illinois, because that's the video that we're going to look at next. Um, if you don't know about East St. Louis, East St. Louis was um, really made famous by Jonathan Kozel in his book, Savage Inequalities. It's one of our most impoverished communities in the country. Uh, and it was taken over by the state of Illinois. And I've been working in this district for two years. And we put in this very specific um, literacy and learning center model for grades six through 12. And then uh, an, another um, 
uh, consultant for the district, uh, Donna White, who's fabulous, did the um, uh, did daily five for K five. Now we just got our most recent NWEA data in the district, and the high school had the gro- greatest growth in the whole district. And the middle schools, the two middle schools, have seen growth as well. So we're starting to see steady growth with the implementation of this model. That's very exciting for me in a district that has been maligned and one of our lowest performing um, in the country. So obviously, um, this has legs. And it really has to do with that practice. There's not um, kids get the opportunity to do, do, do. Now, the video that you're going to see, it's about a six minute video. And hopefully the technology will be in our favor. And um, the teacher featured, her name's Anjanette White. She's a seventh grade teacher in East St. Louis. Um, And when we started with centers, we had to do a lot as far as modeling behaviors, how to transition from centers, what it looks like to work in a center. And the class that you're going to see is an inclusion class. Um, She has about 27 students in the class, um, five of whom have IEPs. And you'll see her co-teacher in the video as well at some point. And her kids are working in centers. And uh, this video is after about six months of center implementation. And all I can tell you is when we first started doing centers, it did not look like this. (laughs) But I want you to see how... um, uh, uh, what has happened with the kids in, in six months. The other thing I want to point out too is the Lexile levels are all over the place. In a regular level class like this in East St. Louis, um, it is very typical in a class of 27 that you may have two or three kids that are on level and then a substantial portion of kids who are at least two years below level and then four years below level. That is not uncommon. So here we go. We're going to take a look at this video and and um, uh, and then and then start wrapping up for the session. Okay, here we go. Let me know, Laura, if this works. Okay. Okay. Oop, wrong one. Sorry. Katie, we can't hear anything. No. Okay. Can you put a uh, your microphone close to your? Speaker? Yeah. Let me see what um, I can do. Try that, and then um, see what happens. Hold on. Unit about the Hold on one sec. We've defined what the hard. That's not loud enough. Not working. No, it's not loud enough. What we can do is we can send this link out to yeah. everyone who is on the webinar. Yeah, that that's probably better too because it might be a little jumpy too because of connection. So we'll send that link out to you. But um, one of the things that I want, I, I'm just going to show you too, like um, here we go. There's Anjanette talking very, very quickly. just want to show you kind of like the kids though. And, and let me just kind of give a little voiceover when we see the kids working. Um, one of the things that, that we see, you know, with the kids, I mean, they're all working with um, curriculum materials and they're working on a horror genre as well, um, the monkey's paw. And you can see that the kids are working and, and, and just in general, we're going to talk about this during the questions and stuff, but, but what do you notice about the kids? You know, um, what do you see in the classroom as the kids are working? And um, so they're working on citing textual evidence. Um, here's Anjanette too. She's at the teacher-led center and the kids are looking at Frankenstein as a character and she's really pushing them to find the evidence in the text. This is very high level work for the kids as well. 
Um, and the other thing too is you notice that we have them in triads and that's really a classroom management thing because of behaviors and things. What I have found is that the smaller we can make the group, the better. So threes work really, really well. And when we do a, um, uh, uh, another webinar with Sadly, we're going to talk about specifics as far as construction, these kinds of classroom management um, kinds of things as well. But, but just in general, you can see that the kids are very, very focused and on task. Um, uh, and, and although <laughs> they were being filmed by the state, so of course they're going to be on their best behavior, but I can tell you too that that's, this is really the norm that I see now in um, Anjanette's class. Okay, so um, in addition to this video that uh, that we'll send out, we'll send out that link. It's on YouTube. Um, there's also this great uh, um, uh, booklet, uh, ebook that you can download from Sadlier. That's available, and it's Learning and Literacy Center. It's not just for the primary grades. It's a really great resource to just get started um, and, and understanding all the foundational theoretical components of centers, why they're working with the big kids. Uh, and then also, um, uh, yeah, so just that. And, and the other thing I want to bring up, too, about um, data with the case studies Every single school that I've been working with on these centers, and this is why I find it so promising because I'm always leery as an educator of over 30 years when somebody says, oh, this works, this works, this works. But what I'm seeing is, is that, for instance, in Farmington, New Mexico, the two middle schools that I work with there are the Title I schools in the district. And they're the lowest performing in the district. Um, from the state, they received um, an F, and then the other school received a D on their school report card. In one year, we raised it one full grade level from a D to a C. Um, East St. Louis, which for decades has not seen growth in student achievement and performance, we are starting to see shift, positive shift. In Orchid, California, the school that I worked with there had the greatest achievement in the whole district. And now I'm working with another um, district with um, sponsorship from Sadly or another school in the district um, that is uh, Title I. And then also in Rutherford County, same thing. Um, one of the lower performing schools in the district, we're starting to see that positive shift um, as well. So I'm really very excited about the possibilities of this and 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 how we can just start closing that achievement gap. Um, this is where you can find me. This is where I hang out at Literacy World and Katie McKnight Literacy. My website is katherinemcknight.com. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm doing a conference in Wisconsin in June. Um, specifically on centers for two days. It's going to have a lot on skills-based assessment and grading as well um, within the context of centers and, and developing content knowledge and literacy skills. So I hope you can join me and uh, I'll, I'll see you guys in the water park. I, if you don't know about the Dells, um, it's the water park capital of the world. Doesn't that sound exciting? Um, and uh, I guess we'll take some questions. Yeah. Yep, that sounds great. You know, thank you, Katie, so much for uh, for being here and sharing the work that you do. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, I get I get charged up um, to see you know how you're affecting teachers and and trying to help them along the way to reach out to the students. I've got a couple of questions here, so let me just remind you how to get your questions um, here to me. Um, expand your control box on the right hand side expand the question box and then just start start writing it into the uh, the question box um, and then just send it and I will retrieve it so here we go um, this is a middle school teacher sixth through ninth grade um, how many centers would you recommend for these grades and I know you went through this so maybe you just want to review that yeah it, it really depends on the class size um, we don't want more than five kids at a center. That's the maximum. So if you have a class of 27, then you need to have like usually between five and six centers. Now, one of the things that a lot of colleagues do that helps them with prep is to start off with, as you're first starting to introduce it, um, you may just want to do a vocabulary center, um, writing and um, reading together, and then you can double them. 
so you can have carbon copies. So a lot of teachers I know do that, and especially if you're in a 45-minute block as opposed to a 90-minute block, and, and it just cuts down a lot of prep. So, so you can have duplicates of centers, um, and, and that is a uh, really helpful way to get started. The other thing, too, about time is um, uh, you don't want your centers to be that long. Uh, they shouldn't be at, at the middle school level. Really, our threshold is between 13 and 14 minutes, probably more on 12 minute side, 12 to 14. High school, we can start going to about 15 minutes a center. But uh, the neuroscientists tell us that your attention span is generally your chronological age times one. So if you're teaching 12 year olds, 12 minutes is about their threshold to attend to a task. Great, that's a good easy way of remembering. Mm -hmm. Here's the next question. Uh, this person came in a little late to the webinar, um, but is looking for any videos or examples of high schools using centers. Do you have any such thing? Or maybe yeah, on your website? I, I, I do. and. Um, here's the dealio. <laughs> um, I have some really good high school ones, but I don't have permission to post them on my website. So maybe what we can do in the future is, um, uh, um, uh, you know, feature them or something on, on when we do a sadly or, um, one, or a lot of times I do my own webinars as well. So if you follow me on, uh, Katie Midnight, Katie McKnight Literacy, my Facebook page, or just send me a message. Uh, I'll set up one that's just for high school and we can just look at those videos. But I can't post them um, because of permissions and, uh, and, and such. But I do have videos of high schools doing it, um, uh, even an AP economics class doing centers. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, what resources would you recommend for a new teacher who wants to learn wants how to learn to incorporate centers into the classroom. So here's a new teacher. I'm not sure what grade span, but are there any resources out there? I think you know of a few. Yeah, the ebook is, um, I'm curious what grades we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, little guys like K2, um, I, um, I'm a big fan of Daily Five. As far as the older kids, there really isn't anything out there. Um, funny you should say that. I'm, I'm working on a book on that right now. The, the e-books that I'm crafting for, drafting for, um, Sadlier, that we're starting to put out, um, will be really great resources. And that one that was just posted will be a great um, starting one. If you have grades 6 through 12, uh, here's my shameless plug for my two books. I have two books, Common Core Literacy, but don't let the title of Common Core freak you out because that's become kind of a toxic term now. But it really is about college and career readiness. There's a chapter in there on setting up centers and getting started with centers. And the Common Core Literacy book, there's one book for um, English and Social Studies and the other book is Math and Science. And if you follow me on um, Facebook uh, as well, I, um, I am putting up resources there as I'm developing them because there really isn't anything out there for fourth through 12th grade. And, uh, and I'm gonna have a lot of materials available too at my upcoming conferences um, in uh, Wisconsin and uh, uh, Florida. So, and also I'm working on a book. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> so. She's working on it. Yeah, but you know, uh, the next question. To contact me because I'm always happy to talk to anybody, especially newbie teachers. Um, they need all the love and support from us old timers as we can give them. The next question is about uh, receiving the PowerPoint slides. Um, because this is a, a recorded webinar, you'll be able to retrieve that um, the recording. How often do you use centers per week? That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, again, uh, I don't mean to be evasive. It depends. So I know teachers that do them, you know, like three times a week. I know teachers that do them one time a week. It seems to me the pattern that I'm kind of seeing right now is teachers who have a block that it's 90 minutes, they might do them maybe twice a week. The teachers that have a 45 minute block usually do them three times in a week. And then I know some teachers who do them every other week. But one of the things that's really important and one of the teachers that I interviewed yesterday for the work with Sadlier, she said, because um, one of the questions ISM is, what is your most um, 
sage advice that you could give a teacher, a colleague uh, who is just getting started with centers. And Kristen said, I think my first sage advice, the reason why centers didn't work so well for me the first time I tried them, which was last year, last school year, she said, because I didn't do them often enough. You got to do them often enough to train the kids, to get them used to it. Because remember, kids have the attention span of cats. It's just part of their charm. And especially the older they get, the worse their memory seems to get in middle school and high school. So, so it should be regular enough that we start building these habits. Great. Here's an uh, interesting question. Quick question. What about stations for special ed students who receive pullout? How would a teacher set up stations with four or five students? Um, and then how would these stations look like? What would these stations look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've talked to many teachers um, uh, who have inclusion, or uh, sorry, not inclusion, um, pull out or self-contain. And I've had conversations with them about it. And, and let me just say, um, uh, even though by trade, I'm a general education teacher. Um, I, I do a lot as far as inclusion and special education. And um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to, to it too, having a son who has high functioning autism. So one of the things that seems to work more effectively is more individualized instruction. So doing the centers is more individualized instruction rather than um, place to place. Because one of the things that we want kids to do is really collaborate. So what some teachers do with centers, if they have a larger group, for pullout, where if maybe they have like seven or nine students, they may just do a teacher-led center, which is two students, and then two students at another center, and two students at another center, and that's it. And this one teacher that I know in Farmington, one of the brilliant things that she does that I actually use in general education classrooms to get kids started, and particularly in schools where I go and where the kids are not very regulated, is um, she puts out the map of how the kids are supposed to progress at the centers at each table, at each center table. So if you're at the vocabulary, it'll have an arrow that says, okay, now you're going to the read together. And if you're the read together, it's like, now you're going to go to the teacher led center. And it just really helps the kids to um, move on their own. It's really wonderful. Here's a, a question, comment. Um, they missed the beginning, uh, but how would you use centers with multiple grades in the classroom at one, when there are multiple grades in the classroom at one time? And secondly, do centers operate every day of the week, or is it okay to introduce slowly once or twice a week? And I think you've answered that. Yeah, I think we answered that too. Yeah, introducing slowly, absolutely. Um, if you have different grade levels, I, I think... Um, Again, what you would do, one of the things that you could do so you're not prepping like crazy, we didn't get into it in this one because this is really like an introduction. It's it's the primer, right? Is that when we start getting into like nuts and bolts of, of how to design the centers and classroom management, one of the things that I like to do, and this is very much a DI strategy too, is I like to give kids choice at centers wherever I can. So for instance, at the vocabulary center, I might say you could do a foldable or you could do a vocabulary slide. So if you have multi-age kids, you can do the same thing and say, okay, so if you're in this um, uh, 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 grade grouping, you're going to do this. If you're in this grade grouping, you're going to do blank. Now that's a lot of prep. And, um, and whenever you teach two grade levels, it's an extraordinary amount of prep. You're going to find too that that teacher led center is going to be extraordinarily important and useful, um, in order to meet the needs of, of both of those grade levels or the multiple grade levels. Yes, I would think that it would help the teacher uh, organize and manage the classroom uh, mm -hmm. multiple grades. There is always, uh, I'm sorry, there always seems to be many examples of centers working well for struggling st schools. Do you have examples of similar success and growth for schools that are, al are already experiencing a high degree of success, especially interested in the middle schools? Yeah. Um, I, uh, kids who are gifted and academically talented, um, they oftentimes get um, uh, disenfranchised in classrooms. So again, the, the beauty of that center's model is that we can really meet the needs of, of, of students. So in kids that are um, 
uh, where we have you know kids that are on level or exceeding, again, what we can do is create centers that probably build more on choice and such. That teacher-led center too is really going to be about pushing kids even further along um, in their academic abilities. And 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 kids that are doing well in school oftentimes get overlooked. So just as we can um, meet the needs of kids who might be struggling learners, again, our kids who are excelling, who may not get um, the opportunity to meet with the teacher because they're doing just fine in class, have that opportunity as well. The other thing too is that for um, gifted education, academically talented kids, one of the things that they that kids really need is that greater independence too, and being able to make choices. Um, my good friend Richard Cash, who's a national expert in gifted education, um, we talk about that quite a bit, and he's also co-presented with me on the center's model and talking about it from the gifted um, and academically talented perspective. Because imagine too, with the reading together is that we can really get some challenging texts in there, for example. Um, and also you could have an inquiry station, all kinds of, of things. That's awesome. That's all the questions that we have uh, right now. Um, if you all think of another question, Katie is available. I'm sorry, I didn't put the uh, the website down here. So um, it's uh, KatherineMcKnight.com. Why don't yeah. you say it? Yeah, KatherineMcKnight.com. Just Google me, um, and uh, you can reach out to me there, or you can reach out to me on my Facebook page. I'll be honest with you, I'm not as good um, uh, getting messages on my Facebook page as I am when people mail me directly. So if you email me, um, I, um, I'm, I always respond. So, and, um, I, 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 uh, go work in a lot of different schools, do professional development workshops, things like that. Children's birthday parties, weddings. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So. Well, as always, Katie, it's just <laughs> been a delight to have you on today, and um, we will be scheduling Katie for additional in, uh, webinars in the future, so you all are on our list, and we will um, alert you when Katie has, uh, will be joining us for another webinar in the near future. So thank you, everyone on the phone, uh, spending your afternoon with us. We know that this is a difficult time. Sometimes it just is can be a bit bewitching hour. So thank you for joining the webinar. We'll let you know how um, Katie, uh, you know, more webinars that are coming up in the future. Also, we'll send you a link to this recorded webinar, and it will also have a link to the down to for you to download the ebook. So you're all going to get those two links in a an email in the next 24 hours. Katie, thank you for your time and your expertise and uh, we love having you. Thank you very much. Have a great, great evening, everyone. Bye. All right. Bye-bye now.